About four years ago, I made a couple of videos on a little series called Shantae. A lot has changed for WayForward's flagship series in that time period. With the release of Shantae vs. Revenge, the series not only revived itself from, at the time, Eight Your Slumber, but also generated interest in WayForward's original works, resulting in more digital releases like Mighty Switch Force, and demanded the Shantae series, with the original Game Boy Color game being re-released on Virtual Console in 2013 so that any sane person that wanted to play the title didn't have to fork over a couple hundred dollars for a game over a decade old. Perhaps most notable is Wave for its first boy in a crowdfunding with the Kickstarter for Shantae Half Genie Hero in 2013. Full disclosure, I did in fact back the Kickstarter. Said Kickstarter, while successful in its goal, wasn't without its share of controversy. No. Really. When it was initially unveiled, there was a fair amount of outcry about the appearance of Shantae being lighter than its usual portrayal. Yes, the series whose first game had to be shipped with Resident Evil Gaiden just to get it into store shelves, became popular enough that people were complaining about the character's skin tone. But we're not here to talk about the virtual skin pigments of the future, or the troubled release of the past. Instead, we're taking a look at the present and most recent entry, Shantae and the Pirate Curse on the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U eShop. The long way to follow up to... A long way to follow up, Shantae and the Pirate Curse is the latest title by Way 4 Technologies and the finale to the Shantae trilogy. Like Shantae Risky's Revenge, it was first announced in Nintendo Power, this one being the penultimate issue. Unlike Risky's Revenge, this title is a collaboration with Inti Create, the studio behind Mega Man 9 and the Zero series. So, does Pirate Curse end the Shantae trilogy with a bang or a whimper? Let's get ret to go! The story takes place after the events of Risky's Revenge, opening on a high note as the Ammo Baron attempts to level Scuttletown and Shantae sets out to stop him. After a thrilling boss battle, the Royal Guards arrive to summon Shantae for a trial for attacking the owner of the town. Later that day, Risky Boots pays a visit to Shantae and informs her that an old adversary, the Pirate Master, has invoked a curse on her crew who attempt to bring him back from beyond the grave. With the possibility of this threat returning to the land, Shantae must team up with Risky to stop the Pirate's curse from being fulfilled. As you may have noticed, there is a lot to unravel in Pirate's Curse. And unravel it does, as the plot devolves into the same fanservice filled, fourth wall breaking silliness that you've come to expect. There's a greater attempt at character building than before, as well as more interactions and combinations between the cast, but the characters end up as token tropes or resort to overused cliches. As a result, the plot becomes predictable and unexciting. Make no mistake, this is a very silly game, full of 80s references ranging from aliens to Ghostbusters, to He-Man and Star Wars, to even The Legend of Zelda. Most of these jokes and references, while cute, didn't really add anything to the narrative outside of the cheesy 80s storytelling on display. Try as it might for something more, Shantae and the Pirate Curse summon parts are equally as silly as its countless references. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse returns to the realms of the ridiculously named genre of Metroidvania. Seriously, Metroidvania is such an awkward word to describe a genre with. Someone needs to come up with a better word for this genre, so I might as well give it a shot. Henceforth, I deem the 2D Plot Tracker, a much better word for describing the genre that Pirate's Curse falls well into. A 2D title full of precise platforming, item grabbing, and backtracking, with plenty of booty in the form of squids and dark magic to spare. Unlike the last two entries, there are no animal transformations. Gone are the monkey and the elephant. This time around, you collect pieces of pirate gear in order to overcome obstacles over Six Island, ranging from a pistol to shoot from afar to a cannon for assaulting enemies below. You can still buy upgrades and new moves from a shop, but outside of hair whipping, there isn't much in terms of permanent returning equipment. Thankfully, the new items are grand additions, with many of them having multiple uses. For example, the magic lamp can be used to absorb magic and scent, but it can also pick up fallen heart and gems that are just out of reach. The hat is mainly used to go over large gaps, but it also gives a slight vertical boost to your jump. Even temporary items like pike balls and the bubble shield are more useful than ever for racking up damage and... making numbers pop up? Now at first, it seems like an odd choice to have them appear without, say, a health bar, but it works in keeping the flow of the game consistently fast-paced. When you see your health deplete, you associate that damage with a certain attack, thus the importance of avoiding powerful blows and finishing off your opponents as quickly as possible instead of how many more hits you need to take them down. It also helps reinforce that your pirate gear is... less than useful for combat, like the pistol and its measly one point of damage without upgrades. What few rough points Risky's Revenge had have been ironed out. The map is a massive improvement over Risky's Revenge, as it actually shows you where you're going and the area you've already explored. It still has problems like doors not showing up until you've actually gone through them, but it's an improvement nonetheless. The Rogue's Gallery has a lot more diversity, and the overall difficulty is much more challenging. Traveling between islands is smooth as butter thanks to Risky's ship serving as a hub. The islands themselves are impeccably well designed. 
all of them varied and smartly built for speedruns and reward for size platforming. It lent itself a long way towards preserving the pace, as quick as the player's reflexes will allow them. Each island shows how much dark magic and squids there are left to find on them, with dark magic being placed in areas outside of dungeons. It all helps to make the backtracking all the less time-consuming and tedious. What is tedious are the locked rooms that appear in a similar fashion to The Legend of Zelda. They slow down the game as you have to beat every single enemy on screen before you can proceed. Come to think of it, there's a lot of parallels between the structure in Pirate's Curse and that found in the Legend of Zelda series. There's a lot more puzzle solving, more thought process based on the environment and the tools at the player's disposal. But wait, wasn't Metroid a combination of Super Mario Bros. platforming and the exploration of The Legend of Zelda? Yes, but- And don't you use an item to solve a problem in order to continue your adventure in most 2D plot trackers? Yes, but the way Pirate's Curse handled its structure falls more in line with the Legend of Zelda series. It's somewhat difficult to define what exactly separates the two with their overlapping elements of exploration, but the key difference is that the Legend of Zelda series, the original notwithstanding, tend to be more narrative-driven in terms of structure, whereas Metroid and most 2D plot trackers are driven by the player's actions and skills. In the latter, a problem is solely solved with your most recently acquired skill, or through an exploit called sequence breaking that allows the player to get to areas that they normally wouldn't be able to at that point. There are some exceptions, of course, but they don't actively involve every single tool at your disposal. It's more situational, like getting past the door with a certain item, than consistently using said item for exploration. In the Legend of Zelda series, every piece of equipment plays an active role in exploring the dungeons and traversing the land. They complement each other and the game design, which takes advantage of every item the player has acquired at that point and presents them with an appropriate challenge to overcome. Again, it varies depending on the game, but you'd be hard-pressed to find something like finding Agahim with a butterfly net from A Link to the Past in any 2D plot tracker. While Shantae and the Pirate's Curse certainly contains many common elements found in the genre, the overall design takes more cues from the narrative nature found in the Legend of Zelda series. There are several times where the game will lock you in a room full of enemies and will only unlock once you defeat them. When you defeat all the enemies, an item will appear, usually a key. In cases where an item isn't dropped, the enemies are best handled with the most recent addition to your toolbox, and the pathway will open up once all of them are disposed of. The bosses are often difficult to damage with basic hair whipping, thus the use of a recently obtained item is needed to exploit a weak point for maximum damage. Each dungeon contains a map that lays out the structure of the dungeon, the boss room, and other important locations, with each succeeding one building upon the last dungeon, finding new and creative ways to use your ever-expanding arsenal instead of relegating it to a more situational usage. Even the currency is represented with a gem that looks like the rupees from The Legend of Zelda despite the gems never looking like that in the entire game. This change in design, aside from the locking rooms, isn't a problem for Pirate's Curse. In fact, it actually works in favor of it. By combining certain items, you can cut down immensely on the time spent backtracking, and in some cases, sequence break the game. Backtracking itself is often cued by the ongoing narrative, thus leading to less confusion about where to go, while often providing an opportunity for the player to collect items they weren't able to on their first visit. The boss battles were all thrilling tests of your skill, not only challenging you to beat them with your newest piece of equipment, but also previous ones in combination. This combining of skills is what pushes Pirate's Curse above its predecessors. There's very little in the way of complaints. However, there is one thing that was consistently annoying throughout the adventure, that being the use of the items on the touchscreen. Anytime you want to use an item, be it health, defense, or offensive, you have to double tap the item, once to select it, and a second time to activate it. It may not sound like much of an issue, but in the heat of a tricky boss fight, not being able to use an item immediately can be the difference between being able to survive a hit or not. There's also some rather outdated concepts that should have been left in the archaic 80s titles that inspired it, like the Midway Knockback in Castlevania, but none of these nitpicks detract from how polished the entire experience turned out to be. Well, mostly polished. I did encounter one glitch which caused the music to stop playing, Shantae to become invulnerable, and unable to hurt enemies that set up projectiles. I have no idea what caused this, but at the very least it wasn't game-breaking. It was more amusing than it was irritating, and everything returned to normal upon moving to the next screen. Ultimately, what few flaws it has are minor hiccups rather than major missteps. Presentation-wise, Pirate's Curse's graphics are largely identical to that of Shantae Risky's Revenge, just in a higher resolution than they were in DSiWare. It's a testament to how gorgeous the sprite work in Risky's Revenge was, and indeed is, as it still holds up four years later. By which I mean it's amazing that the unused sprite work from Risky's Revenge looks as lovely as it does here. For those of you who are unaware, Shantae Risky's Revenge was originally meant to be an episodic trilogy, with the first episode slated for DSiWare in 2010. This proposed episodic adventure never came to be as the game was released as a single standalone download on DSiWare in 2010. As one might imagine, a lot of content was left out of the final product, with several official screenshots showing off areas and enemies that never appear in Risky's Revenge. However, they do appear in Pirate's Curse. There are several areas and enemy sprites which appear similar to the one shown four years prior. 
it's likely they decided to incorporate these unused elements rather than flat out recycle them, since most of these locations don't contain the same enemies or layouts originally seen occupying them. They did the same thing with Risky's Revenge. In the cancelled Game Boy Advance sequel, Risky Revolution, the mermaid made its debut appearance, but wasn't playable until Risky's Revenge. Whatever the reason for their inclusion, the new sprites blend in seamlessly with the old ones, and the old ones have received more frames in their smooth sprite work. The backgrounds are brimming with detail, and the animation is almost pixel perfect on characters, enemies, and the very detailed bosses. The art design complements the level design, with some subtle visual indicators the keen viewers will be able to spot. There's so much detail to every single sprite that, frankly, it's almost too good. Whenever Shantae is using her pirate gear, you can see her wearing a bandana with a skull and crossbones, but you never actually see her wear that outside of her pirate gear, not outside of cutscenes at least. Now as I'm recording this, Shantae and the Pirate's Curse is only available on the Nintendo 3DS eShop. However, it will be coming to the Wii U eShop later this winter, so bear in mind that the game may not appear the same in widescreen as it does on the 3DSs. As for the sound, Jay Kaufman delivers another solid soundtrack full of great remixes of previous Shantae shanties, and will compose original tunes that set the mood for every scenario. If there is one weak link in the sound design, it's the voice work for Shantae, voiced by Christina V. She doesn't do a bad job necessarily, but her talents are completely wasted on saying, at most, a line or two in every conversation. Sometimes, she doesn't even say the full line. Hello. It doesn't add any more personality to Shantae than the writing does, it's just there for the sake of having a line spoken rather than read. If they wanted to have Shantae narrate more lines, that's fine, but they should have either added in more lines of voice dialogue to justify the inclusion, or saved her premiere performance for Half-Genie Hero. All things considered, it's largely insignificant to an otherwise superb presentation. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse nails nearly every aspect a threequel should. This is easily the best game that Wave 4 Technologies, and Integrates for that matter, has ever made, and is thus far the best release game on the 3DS this year. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse earns a 9 out of 10. That's all for now, folks. Until next time, game on, my friends.